Let me share my screen here. I think it'd be good that we start with a uh, word of prayer. Um, let us pray. Eternal source, we thank you for technology. We thank you for this time to gather. We thank you for friends and family that are here as well. As we begin to look into these sacred scriptures, we ask that you begin to bring illumination um, that you begin to show us things that we never saw before and bring rev relevance to today. We thank you. We love you. It's in the name above any many names we pray. Amen. Awesome. So we're going to start off with the scripture readings. Um, oh, I do apologize. It looks like I'm having some trouble. Can y'all still see me okay? Yep. Okay. All right. So we're going to start first with Micah 6, uh, verse 1 through 8. I'll begin the readings, and then uh, if you have a desire to step in, um, I'll leave a pause. You can step in when you need to. Make sure to unmute your line and read that passage. When you're done, um, we can move on. Hi, Miss Carolyn, good to see you. So our first scripture is uh, Micah, the sixth chapter and verses one through eight, and it reads, hear what the Lord says, rise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now, what King Balak of Moab devised, devised, yes. What Balaam son of Beor answered him and what happened in Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Here ends the first reading. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians, uh, the first chapter, verses 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to re reduce to things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In that order, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Our gospel reading will be coming from Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses one through 12, and it reads, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. So as we have heard these readings. Is there anything that has come up to mind? Anything from your past lessons with these passages um, that just popped into your mind uh, as we were reading those? Not from the past, but um... As I was reading, um, yep, uh, no, these days I think it was that covered the uh, gospel reading. And it talked about the, the, the um, <laughs> I always said, blessed are the poor and blessed are the meek, that that is sort of what you should be in terms of being humble and the like. But you can also read that as, that's not the condition God wants you to be in, but you're blessed because he's going to change that condition and fill you and make you whole. So blessed are the meek, they're going to receive the earth. And blessed, you know, are the poor in spirit for they will be, uh, they will be filled or whatever. But it's, it's, it's almost like the promise of God that even though things aren't great right now, they will be at some point. Rick, thank you for that. Um, I have a follow-up question to that um, for my understanding. So what I'm hearing you saying is that this part of what is called the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus is speaking to a place that could be a deficit and being a promise, being a promise to that this will be completed, you will become whole in that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. yes. Oh, I like that. That's good. I'm I right. never really looked at it that way before.
anyone else. I'm just writing notes, so you can jump in when you when you can. Well, <laughs> for me, uh, I love all of these passages, but the First Corinthians text is one that I have leaned on mightily for the probably the last 18 years um, because uh, just of my own work in the world and my perspective. And so the passage basically essentially says that, you know, Paul's preaching and ministry methods and style, uh, especially as he's building these churches um, in Corinth is, is considered foolish to some uh, and, and it's a stumbling block to others. And what he's saying is, you know, for the, for the Gentiles, uh, the Greeks, they were very well read. They were learned people. They knew all of the classics and all of the mythology and, and all of the philosophies. And so they were looking for something that made more sense, something that had more of an appeal. And to them, this gospel of Jesus was just kind of foolish. It just, it was almost above stupidity because they couldn't understand why someone would fall for uh, a religious system that required everybody to, you know, follow a man that ended up being executed. Uh, what, where's the power in that? You know, they were looking for some big triumphant story with a king and or a prince or someone with great wealth and great power and great influence, a saga or something that had multiple characters and pieces. And, you know, yeah, the healing stories and the turning water into wine was good, but for them, it ended in death and it was like uh, too short of a tragedy. It didn't make sense to build a whole religious system off of it. And for the Jews, it was a stumbling block because their faith uh, taught them that the Messiah was not yet come. So it was a stumbling block in that they couldn't wrap their brains around what, you know, Paul or anybody else was teaching in the name of Jesus because Jesus wasn't their Messiah. So they couldn't become a part of these communities or these churches and actively become a part of the congregation and give and donate and be of service because they were like, wait, we're, this isn't our Messiah. We're still waiting on our Messiah. And so the point of Paul's message is that, you know, to some people, what you say will be foolish to other people, what you teach and what you say or how you present or whatever might be a stumbling block because of something that they can't get over. But if you are called by God, God can use the foolish people or what, who would be considered foolish to uh, challenge or confound or to transform or even inspire those who would be considered wise traditionally. And equally, God could use someone who's weak, uh, someone who, you know, uh, doesn't come on a horse riding in with, you know, blazes of glory, but someone who comes in on, the, on a donkey with palm leaves and fronds waving. So God's can, God can use the weak to overcome, overpower, or to transform the strong, but I also think of it personally. You know, you can come from very little means or from a certain side of the tracks or you know, without very much intelligence or from a certain background. And you can rise to certain heights and become successful if you were truly called and prepared and given opportunities you know, to shine in a particular way. So I just love that this passage for many reasons and that's what stood up for me. Thank you, Pastor. I love how you were um, just mentioning how it can begin a conversation of leveling the playing field because the rules in this particular conversation is, I think Rick, you said something about it. it's it's not what we're used to talking about. It's not the, the walking with pride. It's not the walking with confidence. 
it is the acknowledgement and celebration of those who are, are persecuted for righteousness sake, right? It's this, uh, it's, and I love Rick, to your point, it seems like uh, I can also see that viewpoint that Jesus is speaking to those who are experiencing these pieces of calamity, experiencing these times where they have to be a peacemaker and say, you know, keep doing the work, uh, maybe uh, is, is what, something that he was talking about there. Pastor, to your point, um, back in the day, this Roman colony um, was, was so hedonistic that there was a comment about uh, live like a, um, a Corinthian, which is <laughs> you know, <laughs> avarice, it's a, lot, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of things going on. And also because it was a colony of, of Roman uh, influence for a hundred years, prior to Jesus's um, death and resurrection, they were learning the systems of the Roman Empire, also in the area of learning Greek literature and Greek ideology as well. So they are on the principle of wisdom. Athena was the god of wisdom, the goddess of wisdom, and they had temples erected around them as they're doing this church. So it was good that um, I can see that parallel with Paul um, encouraging those who are in a time of struggle to hold on to what is true and pure. And Jesus also being in a Gentile area, he was in Capernaum. So he was in an area that was not, uh, you know, Israel. He was in what they would call Gentile country. And looking back at Micah, he also uh, were, was living in a time of calamity. Um, the Micah passage that we read here, Micah was one who was raised in times of war, who was raised in times of siege. He was before Jeremiah, but he was uh, akin to Isaiah, Amos, and other prophets like that. But he dealt with seeing with his own eyes the destruction and the captivity of Israel. And it's interesting that <laughs> His, the point of contention, especially within um, a lot of the commentaries, because uh, I took a look at different commentaries, it, there is a criticism um, of Israel, and they're, they're, they're pointing that, that Micah was angry and, and correcting, and it, it seems to read that as well. In some of the passages, when we, let me look down to one of the passages, I was like, wait, um, he was like, uh, hear the controversy of the Lord. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be contentious with the Lord. Um, that seems, seems to be a lot. When we're looking at all of these areas or looking at these prophets and these preachers speaking in times that is um, different than their circumstances, right? Ricky, blessed are the peacemakers. And then Paul is like, you know, wisdom is not going to help you here. And Micah's like, you know, uh, you still have to seek justice. You still have to be peaceful, even though you're in captivity. Um, what do you think the lectionary uh, and and how this is coming together for this this Sunday's reading? What what is coming up for 21st century church in these different passages? What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? What's coming up for you, Rick? You already mentioned um, some things, but I'd love to hear more from you. Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, I think they all have guidance for living. Mike has always been one of my favorite passages to, to do, do justice and love kindness and be humble. Walk humbly with your God. Um, Can I, I ask a question there? Mount highlights. You know, again, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the humble, blessed are, yeah. right? Uh, it's, not, it's not the elite of society. And that's what, what Paul is saying in Corinthians. Not many of you were well educated, not many of you were born highly. Um, and yet we're all brothers and sisters, looking to God. So. I love it. I wanted to um, bring something in the room that, that uh, you talked about the verse eight. Um, he has told you, O mortal, or, or, or mortal, what is good. 
And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and walk humbly with your God? In the room here, what does that mean for us? I know the United Church of Christ uses um, this for um, their mission endeavors. Uh, but what does this mean for you when you read that? Rick, you talked a little bit about it. It's a guide for living. I love that. So to, to, to offer some places of thinking, I went to the World Council of Churches um, and the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of 352 churches in more than 120 countries. That's um, approximately 580 million Christians worldwide. And there was a particular article about Micah 6, 8. And I, I wanted to uh, bring a couple of quotes and see um, some responses around this. Um, one of the quotes was from um, a book called Man is Not Alone. Abraham Joshua Hensel explained the mutual relationship between worship experience and Micah's question, what does God expect of you in the following way? And I quote, religion is for God's sake. The human side of religion, its creeds, rituals, and institutions is a way rather than the goal. The goal is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. When the human side of religion becomes the goal, injustice becomes the way. Read that last sentence. Inclusive, when, um, excuse me, when the human side of religion becomes the goal, injustice becomes the way. I see a response in the chat as well. Oh. Yeah, John Wagner just sent a message in the chat and I just sent an invite to see if they could unmute, but it says that their mic is locked, but they sent a comment that said um, that building a uh, build a level, level playing field for all in the world is a comment. Thanks, John. Jim, I, I think this goes along with what you were saying in the World Council of Churches. If you look right before that that verse of do justice and love kindness, the, the Lord doesn't want sacrifices and ceremony and, and empty words and and uh, the bells and uh, the what are they what do they say smells and smells and bells. <laughs> um of, of the church that's all just kind of ceremony for our sake um and what god wants is truly what comes out of that not not the human ceremony but the, the result if you will of that of doing justice in the world and being kind and being humble I think that's what's so striking about the combination of these three texts in the liturgy or in the liturgical cycle um, for Sunday, because we have on one hand, kind of like you're saying, Rick, this, this invitation to just do this because this is what is to be done and not because it gives, you know, the smells and bells and the pomp and circumstance, but because it needs to be done, <laughs> whether that's the task at hand or, you know, making a certain decision, being a part of the community, uh, or trusting and having faith in God to complete a thing that was started. And then we move to kind of Jesus saying, and continuing that we have to live our faith in action and we can't just settle for the status quo or for uh, mediocrity because 
it, it is what it is. You know, if you have something to give, give it. If you are, have something to offer, do it. Uh, if you have peace to give, give it, you know? Um, and then kind of to Paul's point, and it's not going to always make sense. It's not going to always be the most rational or reasonable approach. It's not going to be the always the tried and true. It might sometimes be that, certainly, you know, there's a reason why we say if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, and there's also an opportunity to say, even if the method isn't broken, if it isn't yielding fruit or if it's not effective, the method might not be broken, but it might be outlived or it might have outlived its time. And so what Paul is saying is that, yeah, we do what's right for the sake of doing what's right. And we also don't just uphold what we've always done for the sake of just doing what we've always done if it's not effective. And even if it doesn't make sense to change something or to live into a new diff a culture or to blend in religious or spiritual practices from other cultures and traditions that form a new community, even if that doesn't make sense, what I love how you lifted up JM, you know, as this new church is forming, there, there are pieces from four different major cultures and possibly dozens more that influence their language, their customs, how they eat, how they pray, what they're arguing about, <laughs> what they decide to do with their time, how they decide to serve the community. And some of it made sense to people, you know, and some of it was a stretch for others who might have done things in a different way, but wouldn't have otherwise learned how to do those things differently had they not come together. So I just think it's interesting how all of these texts come together to kind of urge us forward, even if things don't quite look how we think they should. So succinctly spoken, thank you so much for that. <sighs> I really love what, what you were saying, and I actually wrote um, a note down, um, a question actually about it, um, because you brought up the conversation that Jesus calls us to, which is loving our neighbor. But with the over the overall question of what God expect, what do God expect of you? How does loving your neighbor fit into that um, that thought process. What does loving your neighbor look like that would answer, possibly answer that call of what God is expecting from you? Does that make sense? So you're asking, how does loving our neighbor look like what Jesus and Paul and Micah have invited us to do? Is that what you're asking? Yes, in particular, Paul's, um, excuse me, Micah's question, um, which, uh, you know, when I read the, the quote, it said, what does God expect of you? That was the question in which the answer to that quote was. And I'm asking, how does God expect us to love our neighbor? That, I think that's easier for I'm, I'm, I just wanted to rephrase, but I'm going to be quiet and let others people talk. <laughs> I think if you love somebody, you're going to treat them kindly and justly. Kindly and justly, thank you. Anything? John, I'm going to try to see if you can unmute again. John says in the chat, okay. Care for each other to the point of corrective action where and when needed. Amen, John. Amen. John, do you have the ability to unmute now? Because, or would you like to say more about that? Because I really enjoyed that. I wanted to hear if you had anything. That, um, uh, Carolyn, I saw that you unmuted yourself as well. Yeah, I liked what Lawrence had said earlier about um, we seem to reach a level of mediocrity and, and stay there. 
I've, I've seen that my whole life in my career. Boy, I, I often said that in one place of employment. Oh, gosh, we've reached a level of mediocrity. Hoo-hoo, you know, just very sarcastically. But if we could get past that and stretch ourselves, it would just bring in a whole different dynamic and um, a way, a different way of looking at things and thinking of things and maybe going towards some acceptance and some learning. Thank Instead you. Of accepting the status quo. Say that last part again. Instead of accepting the status quo, you know, if you always did what you, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. But if you stretch yourself a little bit more and try and look at something differently or from a different angle, a different perspective. I love that. To me, that sounds like loving your neighbor be willing to have that conversation. Thank you so much for that. We, you know, I put plateau, you said mediocrity, but I <laughs> I said we we tend to plateau and, and remain at a place that is comfortable for us and that is rote. Um, I think that's what I heard you say. Well, I, I, I firmly believe there's a point when, I choose my words carefully here. Um, oftentimes I think brains get turned off Mm. and it's just okay this is how I've always done it this is how I've always thought this is you know what I know to be true well what if you what you know to be true really isn't the truth but, but you don't know that because you haven't stretched yourself because you haven't looked at it another way or open-mindedly or through somebody else's lens that's great Carolyn I, 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 can I use that in, in, in the sermon on Sunday? What if you, what you think of is the truth, isn't all the truth that there is, but you don't know that because you haven't stretched yourself. I think that is, that's brilliant because it's an invitation and it's an opportunity, like what John Wagner was saying, to care for one another by offering some correction. Cause you're not saying, oh, you idiot, you're saying, hey, you got comfortable. But if you just stretch a little bit, if we just stretch a little bit, what else could we discover together? And I think that's a different and more accessible approach. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're, I'll, I'll do something really, really simple. It, it was in my own life. I mean, I have other stories, but I'll keep those to myself. Those are more maybe complex, but growing up, my mother's brother, my uncle Chuck lived in Livonia. We'd go down Grand River, pass eight mile, go by El, Nib El Nibblenook. Not the one that you guys have seen, the old one that burned down. Um, and my dad said on more than one occasion, don't ever eat there, that food will kill you. Now my, my grandmother was German, my grandfather, his family came out of Arkansas. I mean, the last name is Bridges. So it was probably of English descent. Um, so to them, Mexican food, you know, that food will kill you. My dad never had Mexican food. One day I made Mexican food for him from scratch, you know, grilled the chicken, grilled the steak, sliced it thin, made homemade guacamole that was nice and textured and, oh, will you give me the recipe to that? I mean, it took me all day. I mean, I can tell JM you cooked. It took me all day. This is delicious, sis. I can't, oh, will you? Uh, I said, dad, this is the food you told me would kill me. You know, it's just, once you try it, once you experience something new, it's, it's just different. It's different from German. It's different from English. It actually tasted good. It wasn't fried. It wasn't steamed all day. You know, it's, and I have examples that are more complex throughout my career and, and other things that people just get, this is what they know. And there, I think a lot of it is fear. 
is to go outside of what they know. Cheryl, and that reminded me of the, what taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't know where that comes from, but. What did you say? Can you repeat that, please? There's a verse somewhere that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. What you said sort of reminded me of that. And could you repeat, this is from a while ago, we were talking about the status quo. You, you had a, 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 a phrase there that so greatly described status quo. Do you remember okay. that? No. What did I say? It, it, it ended with, because what you get is what you've always gotten or. Oh, um, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. I know Lawrence has laughed at me before of all these little idioms that I have. He was writing them down on the wall one day. I'm taking notes right now. <laughs> well, he does the same to me. He does. <laughs> he does the same to me. Yeah. Um, I um, when you're talking about that cooking, you know, always when you talk about cooking, I can understand that, right? That fusion or that mashup or that um cooking something outside of your tradition but what came to me uh and i know i hate it all the time is the o a process right because you are willing to taste something or experience something that is completely foreign but actually what i want to have a conversation from my point of view is engaging those who have tasted you know the food before and it wasn't to their liking they come to church before right and um, they received pain or they received harm and in 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 hearing you say this it's it's my conversation with those who uh, may want church but not wanting to experience that because of that pain staying in the same thing staying in the same thought process this is all that is going to be and I'm wondering how we can massage or or call people in more to open a, a place so they can see it without necessarily have to be have to buy into it. They can sample it before they. Yeah, and that that is hard because I have a dear friend. I mean, somebody I love with all my heart that I right now am struggling with because. To me, he's gone to the dark side. I mean, just so conservative that if you get out of this little cube, you know, you it's just wrong, it's just evil, it's just, and I tried using an analogy from a Bible study of years ago that we are all we we are all better because of how oh, let's see, how did I put it? Um, I, I used it like a stone soup, I guess is what I did. You just start out with a broth and then you add a little bit of this and then you add a little bit of that and it constantly changes, but the soup is still good. And I couldn't get him past that. It's like, no, when you added this element, you know, insert whatever element you want. I, I think he was at, at the time it was a, um, someone during the Olympics who had turned their back on the American flag or something. And it, so it's like, and I said, but we're a texture. And that's, that's what our society is. It's just like a stone soup and you add everything. And he said, no, that just made the soup awful. So, JM, there are going to be people that no matter what you do, they they have formed their opinion, and they're not going to change. And, and how you get them to change, you might not. Asking them to come out to church on Sunday isn't going to change them, but maybe getting them involved in a project that is near and dear to their heart, getting them involved like, like that. I have a friend who I don't know why, I mean, I've heard her reasons why she's not going to church. To me, they're excuses. So, but, she's, but she enjoys coming with me to crochet. 
She likes coming to the um, concerts and the uh, tailgate parties. So um, you, you do the baby steps. And I think, oh, Rick, go ahead. You, you needed. Just the, you know, meetings like tonight on Zoom are not, are not um, too scary to participate in because you can always just not even have your video. You can just listen in. I, I don't you can know. hide like John does. I think John's trying to save us from Josie. Well, I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> But you know, I, I think there's something to be said for no matter what you do, there's gonna be some people that are for you or some people that are against you and some people that don't want the soup and some people don't want the soup to change, some people that are vegan and some people that don't want you know the meat in the soup and you're like, wow, you know, and, and there's all these different complexities that we have to figure out together. And that's what I love about this image of the banquet table because when Jesus does set a table for us, it isn't just the one kind of soup that only one kind of person can eat. It is, you know, expansive enough, like this soup that keeps growing. And then it also has the bowl set aside for the person that just can't stand any seasoning at all in their soup, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I just think that it's, we need to be more accommodating and we need to understand that making space for others doesn't take away anything from us because yeah the soup when I love that analogy because I love cooking and I love eating um, the soup does change but if it's really disgusting and horrid to everybody or just that one person that just didn't want it to change there's other soup you know, there's other soup. And if we love each other as a congregation or as a community of faith, we learn how to produce what we need. And so that's why I love the idea of a potluck. You know, people are going to bring enough of everything and you have this big old spread. But if one person brought something and only that one person, then there's going to be somebody that goes without. And so I just think we're invited to this banquet table. But also the last thing I wanted to say is, the thing that I love about Salem is that we have many different, and, and I hope to see this increase, of course, no congregation is perfect or all the way wherever they want to be, um, but we have different entry points. So Sunday morning isn't the only access to community. Uh, you know, there are other events and programs and activities that people can do. And it, for some, is the taste and see and the dip in their toe in the water. And for some people, that is their community, knitting or the crochet group, or, you know, that is for them, the prayer shawl ministry is their community or the mission team is their community or going to the endowment meeting is better for them than going to Sunday morning worship. Now, <laughs> it, it takes all kinds, right? Um, and I think if, if we can nurture the fact that we all don't respond to the same thing in the same ways, but if we show up and collaborate that we can all make sure there's enough of what we all need at this table. And John says, John Wagner, not John in the Bible, but you know, sometimes it's the same, <laughs> that the space bar uh, and the audio is not working. So that's why they're not connecting. Well, we are grateful that you're on and we are grateful that you're uh, able to still type in the chat, John. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, such, I love stone soup. I remember reading it as a kid and it just made sense to me. If I only have carrots, I'm gonna put my carrots in this pot and you're gonna put what you have in this pot and we're gonna make something delicious that everyone can can get out of it. Uh, and past, Pastor, to your point, I love that, um, that analogy of even setting some aside. I remember when my mother used to make, um, she used to make vegetable soup and I abhorred okra. I just, I, and I still can't, I can't deal with it. I can't do it. And she would put that okra in that pot and no matter what, I'm, I don't care, cornbread, uh, uh, what is it, crackers? I could put anything in there to try to cover up that okra, I could taste it. 
So what she started doing was she started going through my going through my bowl. And this is this shows the tenderness of a mother, right? She would go through this bowl and she would pick out as much okra as she can. And she would say, I've picked out the most, but if you find some, just eat around it. Just eat around it. Because your cream of okra in hell. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> oh, that was funny to me. But the, the point that I wanted to do, the, you know, the point that I wanted to bring there is you don't have to eat it. But you can still come and sit at the table because crocheting is still community. And when you said it, I was thinking about blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the ones who make peace. Blessed are the ones who create atmospheres for peace. Think about the pandemic that we just went through for three years and how the world was in a state of anxiety and unrest and the unknowing and how we begin to create pockets of peace. We begin to meet online on Zoom. Some people didn't know how to operate Zoom. They were like, I can't, I don't know, but it's good to see you, right? What would happen if we do that intention, if instead of concentrating on the meal we concentrate on the table come in here bring what you have take what you need leave the rest but i want to see you I, so I, the, the person that that doesn't like the soup because of certain elements and we're using soup real generally here um so what do you say to that person is I, like you don't like the okra, we'll just ignore the okra. I mean, in his mind, this is a different person than than the crochet person. In that, um, in his mind, he wants that okra person to leave the country. You know, it is just so black and white. And I mean, we should feel blessed that we can <clears throat> have an opinion in our country and not have to worry about going to prison or being murdered for it. Yeah. And I think that's part of it. Like everyone gets to have an opinion. Like if I'm talking to someone and they say, the people who like okra should go to another country or go back to where they came from or they don't belong. Wherever okra is from, go yep. there. Yep, that's right. I would say, you know, we're all entitled to our opinions and feelings and thoughts. And I want to know where this is coming from. What, uh, what makes you feel that them leaving will enhance your life? How will your life be better? How will our lives be better by them not being here? And then I would ask the question, and how could our lives be enriched by their presence? Because if we can't even think about the possibility, oh no, the, there's nothing they can possibly do to enrich our lives. Are you sure? Because mm -hmm. just the other day, I saw so-and-so shoveling this person's driveway. Or just the other day, this person took food to this person. And I'm through the dialogue. So like you were saying earlier, Carolyn, we can't make anybody change, but we can invite people to see other aspects of a, a conversation or of a, of, of a person. And so if they think, you know, all Mexican food is awful or that all, you know, certain kinds of people are terrorists, let's introduce new information and show them Mexican food that isn't making them sick or certain kinds of people that they that fit this stereotype but aren't terrorists or whatever, you know, like and and then instead of saying now see, you know, you were wrong. Say, you know, hey, I hope that we can have dialogues like this in the future where we can share our perspectives with one another. Because then what happens is when they leave, they keep thinking about, wow, I didn't know that you could have this kind of food and not get sick. But the, when I love that analogy that you gave because you gave them the food first that was prepared with love and I know it tasted amazing. And then they were already open and accessible to receiving it. But if you had said before eating it, okay, 
this is what we're going to have. And I know you don't like it, but you're going to try it. It has a different appeal. So if you say to someone, and I've had conversations with people, racist people, people who hate Black people, who hate Jewish people, who hate gay people. I mean, they just hate everybody. And I'm like, is it that you hate everyone or is it that you're unhappy with yourself? And when you ask questions like that, it gets people a little riled up. But if you can stand kind of in that space with them, you realize, like you said before, it is just about fear. It is inadequacy. They feel threatened. They're scared. They don't understand. It's ignorance. It's a whole bunch of other things. And it comes out in these tirades because maybe they don't have the language to express how they're really feeling. And I think it goes back to, to what you stated earlier of that mediocrity might not be it, but it's there's a reason why they feel that way. Something happened in their life, whether it was in their home life or they were abused as children or they were in the military and they were taught this is right and this is wrong. And then they just, they got so indoctrinated in that that as the world started to change and evolve, they didn't change with it. And so the world is changing and they're going, no, the world's wrong, I'm right. I think we're doing a lot of that in our, in our society right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's partially, I mean, it, that's a whole other topic of why this country is so divided, but there are people that wanna grow and learn and expand. And, and there are people that just, this is what I feel and I think and I'm not moving past this. No, go ahead, Rick. Right. You know, it's at some point you get to the point. You know, don't cast your pearl before swine. And even and even even Jesus had his disciples shake the dust off their feet if they weren't welcomed in the town. So you can you can certainly try, you can certainly welcome, but if somebody's not receptive, then move on. I. Amen. 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 And Church, listen, uh, that was that was so good, Rick. Um, amazing. And we're nearing time, of, um, but I wanted to offer a comment back to Pastor Lawrence and and Carolyn about this um, posture of giving this food to someone and then saying, you know, this was about this is Mexican food or this is the food that you didn't know about or this is the and Rick, to the point you said earlier in the in the in the class about the posture or the conversation that Jesus is saying, you are in this place, but this wholeness is coming to you. And I I offer, you know, think hearing and thinking about that, I offer another another perspective there as well. Um, when you go into these situations, Carolyn, when you went into the situation with your father, you knew you pretty much kind of knew that there would could be a response back that was negative. Mm -hmm. And you were willing to absorb that in order to have that initial conversation about it. If you didn't like it, I don't know if you would have pressed it, but you know, and you brought it to him where he was. You, you, you did the food, you didn't take him to the restaurant, you didn't take him to another restaurant, you made the food yourself, a place of trust, a place of relationship. And you invited this conversation around what was changed after the experience. And I also like, I, the reason I like that is because it kind of, it reminds me of what you're doing, what you talked about your friend coming to crochet class or um, different ones coming to Bible study or different ones watching us on YouTube and not necessarily engaging, but they have the ability to come and eat uh, when they want to, if they want to and taste, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Um, and, and with no um, expectation. You don't have to join. I just want you to taste some good food, right? You, you just wanna, I just want you to come and have relationship and crochet because that peace that you're getting here is still the peace of God. It's still the message of Christ. It is still healing and changing and, and, and bringing people forth just by that connection. Um, and so I, I just love that. I just wanted to comment on that. That was good. Any, any final things before we end in, in, in prayer? Thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. This is amazing. 
Um, any other um, last minute comments or, or things that came up or um, anything you want to lift to the class? Well, I won't belabor a point. Um, let's move forward in prayer. Is there any spoken request that we can lift um, up in prayer? My sister Irene is struggling with her diagnosis of Parkinson's and has gone into a depression. It's been that way now for two weeks and doesn't want to head an evaluation today. I'm giving you more information than probably any of you really need to know, but I got a call from someone at where she lives and a uh, uh, counselor and she had a, an evaluation today and there are things that can be done so that she can feel better and that she can live her life for a longer period of time, especially because her diagnosis came so early in the disease and she doesn't see where it's gonna help her any and just doesn't wanna do anything. So um, keep Irene in your prayers that she gets out of her depression and fights for her life because I can't fight for her. I can support her, but I can't fight for her. Mm -hmm. Yes, prayer for Irene. Irene. Mm -hmm. um, I would lift up a prayer also for those who are um, out in this weather, um, housing insecure and, and without housing. Because um, it's cold out there, so let's do prayers for them as well. I would like to lift up uh, the people that have, you know, dealt with mass shootings and and in the last several days. I mean, anyway, but just it seems like the last few days there have been a lot of mass shootings, and just prayers for our our world and and the people that are in so much pain. Yes. Let us pray. Eternal source, we thank you. In a world that's dealing with so much, we can still find hope. We can still find peace. We can still find love. As we pray, we lift up Irene with the internal struggles that may be coming up because of a diagnosis. We ask for peace, we ask for hope, we ask for love in this moment that she would make a decision to live and live more fully. We also have, we lift up prayers for the housing, those who have housing insecurities in this time of weather, that they find warm places that they will find help to stay warm and to stay healthy. Those who have been impacted by mass shootings, those who are on the periphery and those who are watching worldwide to the travesties of what is happening within our country, the war within the world and all of the pain, death that we are inundated with on a regular basis, I pray for peace and strength for the bereaved and, 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 and justice for those who are seeking it. And I just, I, I know that you are one that answers prayers. And so we are praying these things in the knowledge that you will move. You are still speaking and we are still listening to what you're saying and we're moving with your heart and mind in the world. As we leave this Zoom place, but never your presence until we meet again, shield us and protect us in your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, everyone. So good to see you. Conversation. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Be well. God bless.